Uh, my name is Samir and I'm today I'm going to talk about Blink TV. Blink TV is an interactive query processing framework that supports approximate queries in Spark SQL. So before let me like I mean before I start my talk, let me get a brief show of hands. Like how many of you have actually heard about Spark? Everybody? Or I can I can give a brief introduction. Uh, how many of you have heard about Spark SQL? Okay. Awesome. Uh, what about other things? Like, I mean, have you guys heard about GraphX, which is yeah. another framework that's built on Spark, uh, MLlib, uh, Spark Streaming? Okay. So, for those of you who do not know what Spark is, Spark is basically just an execution engine. So, a way to think about it is like, I mean, we have something that knows how to process data. Okay. And th it, this this framework basically knows how to process data on hundreds or thousands of machines. So, it does not know what to process or how to process, you have to basically tell that to Spark, but it knows how to parallelize, how to distribute this data across like many, many machines and process it very fast. Spark SQL is something that's built on top of Spark, and it basically is a SQL engine that's basically built on top of Spark. So what, what Spark is, Spark is a processing engine, and Spark SQL is a database that's built on Spark, so it takes advantage of all the distributed powers of Spark, it can process data in a parallel system for on hundreds of thousands of machines, and it can also support SQL queries. So you can basically have anything that says, maybe select average from this data, where maybe you're filtering with a certain dimensions and you're doing some things, right? So it supports a fairly generic set of SQL queries on top of Spark, okay? So this talk, what I'll be mostly focusing on today is about another framework that we are building on Spark SQL, which we are calling Blink TV. Blink TV, the core concept of Blink TV is to basically support approximate queries on top of Spark SQL. So these are approximate SQL queries. Like just give an example of what an approximate SQL query is. Let me basically say that, okay, what's the average age of people sitting in this room, right? This is a very small data set, right? Maybe the average age is 25. If there were a million people, right? Let's say like what's the average age of everybody in India. Okay, now there are a, more than a billion people in India, and if I basically go on processing this data point for everybody, it might take me a huge amount of time. Maybe it will take me an hour, maybe it will take me a day, right? Depending on where this data is stored. Approximate query means that I can actually get a really quick answer, which basically comes with an error bar. So instead of saying that the average age of people in India is like 40 plus minus, 40 years, or maybe like average would be something like 40.2222 something, I can say something like the average age of everybody in India is something like 40 plus minus two, right? And what I'm going to show you in this talk today is that we can get these answers, these approximate answers really, really fast, like in milliseconds. And this is where the power of approximate queries comes in. Okay, with this introduction, uh, let me just give you a brief introduction about me. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Databricks. Uh, we are based in San Francisco. Databricks is a company that was started like around two years ago uh, with the purpose of commercializing Apache Spark. So the Spark framework that we just talked about. Uh, what we did was, I was a PhD candidate before that in databases uh, at, at UC Berkeley. Uh, and we were working on this like big data technologies. Uh, Spark being one of them, and uh, uh, something like two years ago, we started in uh, like working towards commercializing this technology as part of DataFix. And uh, I have also worked actively as part of the open source community and App Lab. And uh, at App Lab, we basically created something called Berkeley Data Analytics Lab, like BDAS, uh, that basically constitutes this Apache Spark, Tachyon, LinkedIn, Mesos, many other da big data frameworks that you might have heard of. So. Uh, before I start my talk, let me give a brief intuition of what kind of time scales or what kind of like times I'm talking about when we talk about processing these huge amounts of data that we keep hearing about on many, many machines. So this is just a simple example. 10 terabytes of data on 1,000, 100 machines, okay? How long does it take to process this data? If this entire data, 10 terabytes of data, is basically uniformly spread on 100 disks, Okay, for simplicity, we'll just assume one disk per machine. If it's uniformly spread on 100 disks, now disk bandwidths are anywhere between 50 to 100 Mbps, right? It takes, it takes one second to read 50 to 100 MB of data on one disk, which basically means for 100 disks, you would be able to read 15 to 100 MB of data in one, one uh, go. 
uh, it takes around half an hour to one hour to process any of any data that's of this magnitude, 10 m terabytes, right? Because you have to read this data, you have to probably communicate the, uh, among like various nodes, and then you might have to actually process this data. Now we have a lot of frameworks that leverage memory. Now we all know that memory is becoming cheaper and cheaper, which basically means that now I can read this data two orders of magnitude faster. Memory bandwidth as opposed to 50 Mbps of disks is somewhere around 20 gigabyte per second for memory, right? Which means if I have one like dim, I can read around 20 gigabytes of data per second per machine, right? So if I have 100 machines, I can read 20 into 100 times gigabytes of data uh, in one second. And it basically brings my cost of processing this entire query by a lot, which comes to around like one to five minutes, depending on what kind of query is, how much communication and computation is there as part of the query. Now in this design space, oops, what we are really trying to achieve is sub-second latency. That is, we want to basically achieve query latencies that are even less than a second. It should not even take around one to five minutes to process this data. It should really take around milliseconds, hundreds of milliseconds to process this data. Which is why we cannot even afford to scan this entire data at runtime. Okay? So the obvious solution to this basically involves executing your queries on samples of data, on small amounts of data that you can then basically use to answer your queries really, really fast. Now what does query execution and samples mean? Let me give a brief example of what basically it entails. So let's say I have a small table. Okay? So in this, I have three columns. Uh, this is the ID, this is the city, and this is a buffering ratio. Now, buffering ratio uh, is a well-known metric in video quality. Imagine you're, you, you're watching a YouTube video, okay? And it basically keeps on buffering, or it keeps on pausing and loading and things like that. So buffering ratio basically means the amount of time your video spends in buffering or pausing divided by the total length of the video. Now, if you're watching a video, you can imagine that if a video buffers a lot, it basically correlates with bad video experience. If I'm watching a video and it kind of like stops all the time, uh, the buffering ratio uh, would basically be uh, small. And essentially, this metric, this buffering ratio, in this case, kind of like in some way correlates with the user experience or what, what the user is seeing when they watch this video. So what I have in this table is a metric of buffering ratio for every customer who might be in this city. Right? So let's say I have a, I have a particular customer or a reviewer who is, uh, who is in NYC and he basically saw a buffering ratio of 0.13 for a particular video session that he was part of. Now I have a simple query what basically means what is the average buffering ratio in this table. Now a standard database would basically go in and scan this entire row. Uh, I scan this entire column and give me an exact answer, which in this case is 0 0.2325. An approximate database, on the other hand, essentially would create a uniform sample from this original data. Now, a uniform sample, how do you create a uniform sample? You take a row with some probability, you pick that row to be in the sample, and with some probability, you drop it. Okay, so in this case, I'm just creating a uniform sample that's of 25% like the size of my original sample. So my original sample, had, uh, my original table had 12 rows. My sample now in this case would just have three rows. Okay, and I created a uniform sample from this original table uh, for this particular case. And now if I execute my same query, what the average query, on this column, the buffering ratio column, I get a different answer, right? 0.19 in this case. Now this answer in itself, this approximate answer is not really good, right? Because it does not tell me how far is this answer from the actual answer. So I cannot make any decisions based on this 0.19 or this answer itself. So in order to make this answer useful, as I mentioned in the beginning, you need to associate a concept of errors with this answer, right? So the whole concept of Blink and the systems that we are building is to basically come up with an approximate answer and come up with the error that's associated with that answer. Which is why what I'm going to show you in the rest of the talk is that you can calculate these answers very, very fast. And these answers, once you get the approximate answers with the error bars, might be actually useful in a variety of use cases when we are trying to take any decisions based on these answers. 
One other point that I would just like to highlight is that we just randomly picked this 25% sample, right? If you pick a larger sample, so in this case, I just picked a 50% sample from the original data, your answer would basically go more and more accurate. So in this case, it's, uh, pardon the color, it's 0.22 with a smaller error bar, okay? Now, if we talk about this entire error, uh, uh, sure. So from informed sampling, we mean, we mean that we are picking samples with the, like the like the probability of picking them or dropping them will be the same. Yes. So every portion of the data that I have in my original table is uniformly sampled, or the probability of picking each portion of the data is uniform in my original table. I will also talk about something which is called stratified sample, which might sample different portions of the data with different probabilities. Any more questions up to this point? This is basically the high level idea. So, so I mean, if you basically like are with me over like until this point, I mean, this is this is basically the high level idea. So you're saying that the uh, actual cost of picking up data, because in the earlier case, maybe we are not just picking up data, we are not running the sampling part, mm -hmm. we are just going to like calculating the entire thing. Right. But the cost of picking up data plus computing of that subset of data, that is much faster as compared to. Absolutely. And other thing that I also would uh, talk about later in the talk is that you can create these samples in an offline fashion. So you can basically, like, I mean, uh, have these samples created like beforehand, uh, and then in uh, at runtime you can just only process these small samples of data, giving like milliseconds uh, query. So, so uh, in a realistic environment. Let's say the elements is last one day. Mm -hmm. In order data, let's say it's right. one day. Sure. It could be spread out in the cluster. So what kind of cluster are we talking to in this case? Because if we are going to spread out on hundred nodes, do you delete it from the cluster and then spread it out on hundred nodes? Uh, no. So so in this case I'm not making any assumptions about the compute or the clusters that we have. You can just have a 10 node cluster, you can have a hundred node cluster. Uh, you're bound by the amount of memory you have and the amount of disk space you have, right? With the equation that I just mentioned in the first slide that I showed you. I just wanted to throw the point that locality of data in a cluster may not be in line with the sampling that you're doing. And so you would have some transition there also. So uh, uh, maybe I didn't understand the point. Uh, are you referring to the fact that like once your data comes in and it's on the cluster, it may be just focused on 10 nodes. I see. Okay. And then you have to take it to 100. Like, you have to do uh, that's your choice, right? So essentially, I see. I, I, I see your point. So uh, if if I have like let's say one giga, one terabyte of data, and it's on 10 nodes. Now, if I create a 10 gigabyte sample from that one terabyte of data, you can still keep it on 10 nodes, right? It's your choice. If you want, you can pre-process it and actually like spread it across 100 nodes. That would obviously like have some pre-processing cost because now you're basically distributing this data on 100 nodes. But it would benefit you later if you have lots of queries because now it's spread on 100 nodes and it would be faster. Right? So it's a trade-off between pre-processing and post-processing. Like if you have a lot of queries on that data, it's good to basically distribute this data across like many, many nodes. Okay? Uh, so overall what we have here is basically a trade-off between speed and accuracy. As we operate on bigger and bigger samples of data, uh, it takes more and more time to execute that, that, that query, right? So, I mean, and the error that we see when we operate on more and more or bigger and bigger samples of data goes down with some function. So all traditional databases that we have basically lie on this far end of the spectrum, right? So they always operate on the full data and they always give me something that's basically statistically zero error, okay? Uh, what we have designed NDB to work on is basically this space, this grayed out space, which is that we would give you a quick answer, right? It's your choice to keep on processing this data for like 30 minutes or whatever the time is and get an ex exact answer. But most people who are basically using our database would end up stopping the query somewhere around like one to two seconds or even lesser and then get an answer with a corresponding error if they're satisfied with that corresponding accuracy. Okay, so just to give you a practical example, this is the same query of that I showed you like on 10 terabytes of data, 100 machines. Uh, this particular query, 
the x-axis here is the fraction of the full data that I operate on. So 1 means that I'm operating on the full data. Uh, 10 to the minus 1 means I'm operating on a 10% sample, 1% uh, sample, and so on and so forth. The y-axis here is the query response time. How long does it take to execute this data on this corresponding sample? Right? So if I operate on the full data set, it takes around 1,000 seconds to execute that data on, on 100 nodes. Now, the first thing should not really come as a surprise because it takes around one-tenth the time when I operate on one-tenth the data, right? Because most of these queries are IO bounded. So when I read 10% of the data, it takes around one-tenth the time, 100 seconds. But what's really cool is if you look at the error bars or the accuracy that you incur when you're operating on 10%, 1%, or 0.01% of data. This basically says that if I operate on 10% data, I can still get 99.98% accurate answer in one tenth of the time or in 10% of the time. Similarly, I can get 99.93% accurate answer in like one twentieth of the time. Right? So, so this basically is the power of sampling or approximate queries in general. You don't really lose much on accuracy, but you are getting your answers orders of magnitude faster than normal query time. Now, if we look at this error, this error has a really interesting statistical property. This basically says that the error that I just showed you in green here, basically this error, uh, does not really depend on the size of the original data you have. It only depends on the size of the sample. In other words, the error is proportional to 1 over square root of n, where n is the size of the sample that you're uh, operating on. If we stop and think about this equation in general, I mean, think about the repercussions it can have, right? It means that irrespective of how much data I have, today I might have like one terabyte of data, tomorrow I might have 10 terabytes of data, maybe in an year I have one petabyte of data. Irrespective of how my data grows, a one gigabyte sample would always give me the same accuracy for my queries, irrespective of the size of my original data, right? So this itself, is a very, very powerful concept that basically attracted all of us towards like looking into approximate queries. Right? So this basically says that current now, I mean, the accuracy that I'm getting or the queries that I'm trying to support on my data now no longer is bounded by the how my data actually grows, um, like uh, depending on my business use case. So here in the business, the number of data points or just in the sample. The sample size doesn't mean that what exactly the size of the data will be in on this. It doesn't mean that yes, it does not. So, so it, the, the n here is the sample size, which is basically you're getting out of the corresponding uh, data. Okay. Any more questions up to this point? Uh, so, just one thing is that so the data is increasing, mm -hmm. uh, but it can happen that the data can increase from diversified uh, sources. So it might also happen that with, with time, with the one gigabyte the sample is we are taking, we are talking about that it, it is giving the same answer mm -hmm. or the same error. Uh, it might change with time also. Great question. So yes, the sample that you are basically creating from your original data has to be refreshed. So this claim does not say that you actually created your sample and then you forgot about it. You keep, you have to keep on refreshing that sample. Uh, like if you, if you, let's say that I created a sample today. Tomorrow, if I get my new data, I obviously have to refresh my sample and create a new sample tomorrow. This statement is only commenting on the size of the sample. Okay, uh, great, great point. There shouldn't be a question where you know, you should, you should have a question where you know you should have some weight, some parameters that you weight and then your sample can be handled. Great point. Uh, hold on, hold on to that question because I'll, I'll come to it. Okay. But but that that's that's very good. Uh, any other questions up to this point? I'll I'll talk about the weights and basically the weighted sampling right like in, in a couple of slides. And these uh, like the error numbers that we saw like zero point zero two or eleven percent going further. Yeah. Uh, these are again you know like uh, average numbers across multiple iterations, is it? Uh, no, so this in this particular case, it was just one query that I showed you the numbers for. Uh, it obviously depends on the data that you have and the query that you have. 
So this number are not like representative for all the queries and all the samples that we have, but it was just an indicative example of like what the query would look like in that data set. Yeah, so, um, I, I, might be, I might be, you know, like uh, uh, catching around thought here, but uh, from the sample size that you had shown us earlier about the buffering uh, times or buffering, uh, you know, like rate uh, In that, uh, it was a uniform sample. So, you know, like as you said, the uh, probability of picking or, you know, like rejecting a row was the same. Right. But the differences were quite significant. So, NYC at one point was 0 0.13 versus mm -hmm. NYC at the same point was 0 0.89 or 0 0.7 or something. Right. So, in that case, if I run another iteration, you know, like with the with the same, you know, 25 percent mm -hmm. sample size, then I could be getting significantly different results, is it? Right. So, so uh, basically, everything that we basically have in case of statistical error estimation is indicated or is basically supported with a confidence value. So, I have like 99 percent confidence that this error bar is correct or not. So as you pointed out, like I mean, it's very correct. If I don't have sufficient data, so in that representative example that I showed in my second slide, that was just a kind of example. So every new data point would make a huge difference. Nice. But the actual query, which I showed you on one terabyte of data, actually had millions and millions of data. So any new addition or any new like variation in sample size would not actually impact it. So in general, I mean, uh, the the average that we basically see is is uh, basically having a normal or a Gaussian distribution. So I mean, this is why, like, I mean, it's actually not like impacted by adding a new data point in. So, so as many of you actually like brought up this point, uh, this statement in itself actually comes with a lot of conditions attached to it, right? How do I create my sample? If my data is actually skewed in a particular direction, should I do weighted sampling or not? Uh, if my data is kind of like refreshed continuously, how do I come? basically keep on creating my samples continuously so that like these are accurate representation of my data. Then like how do I process my data? Like if I have a particular sample that's of one gigabyte in size and I just have time to process like maybe half that sample, how do I arrange it so that I can process it very, very fast? Right? So all of these conditions, like a way to think about Blink TV and things that we are doing in case of approximate query processing is just basically to abstract away all of these details from the user and kind of like providing this nice statistical property in a real system. Okay, so how do we do that? We basically allow users to have SQL queries, right? These are simple Spark SQL, Spark SQL queries in which you can have like select average session time from this table where city is equal to San Francisco, and we allow the user to add a time bound to this query. Now, depending on this time bound, the <laughs> system essentially operates or creates a corresponding or operates on a corresponding sample that was in the system and then it returns an approximate answer with the corresponding error bar. Now if the user is not satisfied with the error that basically is returned by the system, he can always increase the time it takes to execute the query. It can basically just like give one more second to execute the query, in which case the system would return an even more finer or even more accurate answer with a smaller error. Uh, now, as far as the query itself is concerned, we actually not only support average that I talked about, we support a fairly general set of aggregate operators. So it could be average, count, sum, standard deviation, percentile, basically any, uh, except with the, with the, uh, except, except uh, approx count and things like that, which are, uh, or min and max, which are kind of like not approximate. Uh, we support a fairly general set of aggregates that we have average, count, sum, standard deviation, percentiles, etc. Uh, we support a fairly generic set of filters or group by clauses in the SQL query that we have. Uh, we also support joins, foreign key joins. We also support nested queries. So you can have like approximate queries on joins or nested queries and so on and so forth. And last but not the least, we actually also support uh, ML primitives. So you can actually have any, uh, like for example, you can have k-means or you can have like any ML functions or even user-defined functions that are written in Java or Scala uh, to basically approximate uh, as long as they are computing some aggregate that you can associate with the error. Okay, and uh, finally, we also allow users to add an error bound to this particular query, in which case the system would give me the fastest possible answer that essentially satisfies those error criteria. Okay, so what is going to be? PlinTV is basically a framework that's built on Spark that does three things. First of all, it creates and maintains a variety of uniform and stratified samples from underlying data. 
these, so essentially, uniform samples are something that I already talked about. These are samples in which every portion of the data is sampled with a uniform probability. Stratified samples, on the other hand, are samples in which different portions of the data are actually sampled with different probability. So just to give you an example of why stratified sample would be useful, let's say I have a, a use case in which there are two cities. Let's say, I mean, so uh, the, the city where I live in, in, in the US is, is called Berkeley. And Berkeley is a very small city, like 100,000 people. And imagine I have like New York, which has like millions of people, and Berkeley, which is the city of 100,000 people, in a combined data set. Right? And now I create a one person sample from this corresponding uh, data. Now it is totally possible that I only pick in that one person sample maybe like 100 or 200 people from Berkeley, and a lot of people, because New York has like way more people than Berkeley, a, a lot of people from uh, New York actually come in that, that corresponding sample. So in order to guarantee that my queries on Berkeley uh, are also kind of like correct in terms of approximation, I can actually sample Berkeley and New York, these rows that belong to Berkeley and New York, with different probabilities. So I can basically oversample or sample Berkeley tuples with a higher probability than New York, which basically uh, might be huge enough. Right, so this is basically the concept of stratified samples. <laughs> uh, once it actually has these stratified or uniform samples from my underlying data, it returns fast and approximate answers with error bars from this underlying samples. And finally, we verify the correctness of the error bars that it returns at runtime. So next, I'll give a brief introduction or a brief kind of like intuition of how each of these three steps actually work in Spark. So first of all, creating and maintaining a variety of uniform and uh, stratified samples from underlying data. So this is basically just a standard like relational operator graph. So every MySQL or every every uh, Spark SQL uh, query essentially gets converted into a relational or logical plan. This basically says, I mean, so this plan, I mean, once you actually, if you have to read it, like, you can think of this as the table scan operator, like something that scans this entire data. It might be this join operator that joins two streams of data that are coming. This might be some aggregate operator that basically does some logic of uh, aggregating many, many people, right? So the way that uniform samples work is that uniform sampling allows you to First of all, insert this uniform sampling operator that's a custom logical operator in Spark anywhere in the query graph or in the logical graph. This uniform sampling operator essentially takes in any materialized input. Right? So it could be this corresponding table that we just saw in the first example. It could be anything that's an integrated data. And it does these three things. First of all, it filters any of these rows with a certain probability. Right, so this is basically analogous to, uh, I mean, basically tossing a coin or tossing a bias coin and filtering out some rows such that a particular sample is created. Then it adds per row weights to each of these filtered rows. Right? Now, why do we need per row weights? Think about operators like sum. If I'm actually calculating a small sample from my underlying data, I need to actually scale it back in my final answer. Right? So uh, for that, I need to have like these per row weights for calculating and scaling back my final answers to the original answer. And then third, it actually does an in-memory shuffle of each of this sample, and then it basically uh, shuffles it. Uh, and the reason we need an in-memory shuffle for the sample that we create is that then any subset of the sample itself becomes a random sample. So let's say that I essentially ended up creating a sample of these four rows. Now, I mean, this is just an illustrative example. Uh, this could be just like a million rows or two million rows. Any subset of these four rows is also a uniform sample. Right? So this basically gives me a smooth trade-off between speed and accuracy. What is the relation between time just for example, I am giving one second. Mm -hmm. How we calculate, OK, one second means this sample. Right. So now if I have this shuffle, right, in memory, uh, now and I want to basically now process or calculate an average on this third column, right? Now my engine would keep on processing this rows one by one. As soon as your time of one second expires, whatever data you have processed until now, you just return it back. 
Okay, so it will not depend on sampling how many uh, I have taken sample from uh, real data. Mm -hmm. So you took uh, you, so so in this case, let's say that I can process two rows in one second, right? Just just an example, excellent example. I first of all I have to create a sample from my original data. In this sample, I have four rows, right? And I shuffle it in memory. Then I have a query that has a time bound for one second. I start by processing these first two rows. I figure out that my time is up. I return whatever is the average of 0.13 and 0.25 to the user. Right? From a higher level, logical view. Uh, the actual kind of like implementation obviously has to take into account query compilation time and kind of like parallelism time. But this is the high level idea. Like you create a bigger sample, like I mean maybe you create a let's say 10 gigabyte sample from one terabyte of data. And then any small subset of that 10 gigabyte sample is also a uniform sample. So depending on the time you have, you just process and return that answer. So, so the actual scanning is being done on four rows, not two. Yes. Uh, wait. Uh, so actual scanning, essentially, this is this is this is done at runtime, right? So actual scanning would only be done for two rows. Four is the amount of data that you have in the system. But you might, at runtime, only have time to scan two rows, okay. depending on the time bound. For that, we need to have the data in memory for this uh, That also is not a requirement. So depending on, let's say my data is in disk, I might be able to scan like fewer rows. If my data is in memory, I'll be able to scan more rows for the same data. So, so it totally depends on the, on the query execution time, exactly. and how much, how much rows we should scan. Exactly. Irrespective of whether it is in memory or on this. Exactly, exactly. So the system itself does not make any assumptions about where the data is. Uh, it can work on on this data, it can work on, on in memory data. It just depends on uh, how many rows it can scan. And that formula is also very simple, right? 50 Mbps for disks and 220 gigabytes per second for memory. So here the query execution time includes the data travel time itself or? It includes everything. So essentially it includes query compilation time. It includes like uh, pushing this data time or pushing this query on like various partners. It basically includes processing time. It also includes like sending the time back to the driver. Okay. So I'm just trying to you know, like, uh, uh, draw some parallels now. Uh, we did a couple of uh, you know, like products in which we were trying to work with the uh, you know like generating algorithms. Mm -hmm. So when we pick up a subset of data and then you, you know, like shuffle it in memory, you pretty much get one starting point and then you start traversing from there on until the time you know, hits and then you know like that is the answer. Yes. So uh, you know like in generating algorithms we were doing something similar that we picked up a point and you started you know like yeah. That, that's a very, very related concept. Well, I don't know, but I'm just sharing. Because we are very bad in terms of which is the use case for these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, designing the system, uh, this would be very helpful. I don't know if I'm How to distribute a job mm -hmm. as a job scheduler because it would know, you know, the reason why I'm doing most. If I to distribute this kind of query, this node memory or this resource will be exhausted. So, here yeah, this would be. Yes, I mean in general, uh, there is this. Uh, no, I mean that's a, that's a great point. Uh, in general, I mean this cost estimation yes. for a query. Right. In general, this has been a well-studied area in databases. Like, how long does my query would take, or will my query take, if I have a certain amount of data in a certain query? Right, so this particular cost estimation is like a very, very well-known area. And we just kind of like make use of that. And this basically depends on where your data is lying, how your query is, and even like a number of other factors, like how your optimizer can optimize this query and so on and so forth. So that's a great point. The engine is very well studied, but it's totally screwed up. It's very hard. It's very screwed up. Even threads could be what you got about Real time. Right, right. I think uh, this is also other no. I mean, so uh, to be to be honest, like we also cannot do like these thread level like so we cannot basically say that our query we cannot basically predict that our query would take like this much time right to the granularity of like nanoseconds, mm. right? Because I mean there are all of these things that are impossible to predict. 
So we are obviously limited by whatever the state of art of query like estimation is right now, but we just make use of that. I just see this being used in a use case. I don't know the related use case. Right, right. The other use case that's very popular is uh, progress bars. So progress bars also make use of query times to basically figure out how much query has been achieved. That, that is kind of like... Uh, so uh, this, was, this was uniform samples, right? Uh, in this case, I was uniformly sampling and creating a particular sample from my original data. Now what does stratified sampling do? Stratified samples samples different portions of the data with different probabilities. So I gave you an example for New York and Berkeley, and I'll show you how that basically got, gets converted into a Spark model. So stratified sampling operator is also any operator that you can insert anywhere in the logical graph for any query. How it works is like, let's say that you have this particular table, and you have two cities. In this case, it was New York and Berkeley. Remember, Berkeley was a smaller city, New York is a much, much larger city. So I want to basically sample Berkeley and New York with different probabilities. Now what does the stratified sampling operator internally, what it does is it first of all splits, logically splits the corresponding input that I have into two branches. <coughs> so in this case, I have one branch that is this, and basically this is logically splitting or logically copying this exact branch into another branch. Now on the left hand side, it essentially creates a summary of my branch on the right hand side, or the original input. What this just means is it basically creates, in this case, just a count of how many values I have from New York in my original data and how many values I have from Berkeley in my original data. Based on this count, I can write any function that basically determines the ratio of sampling. Right? So in this case, I just Basically, let's say I, I want two tuples from New York and two tuples from Berkeley in my out, like actual sample. So I determine that my ratio should be two divided by the count. Right? So it's two by seven for New York and two by five for Berkeley. This could be anything, right? I mean, this is just a, a corresponding function that I made up. But you could actually have any ratio that depends on the size of the original data. Now, once you have that, we basically have to join this table with that table on city. So how the join works is that every tuple that has NYC would be added to every tuple that has NYC in that corresponding table. And then you associate this ratio with the corresponding rows for those NYC values. And for this ratio of 2 by 5 for every tuple, that's basically that has a Berkeley value. Which in other words means that if I now insert a uniform sampling operator that I showed in the previous slide, in the rest of the graph, I can now sample the corresponding values of New York and Berkeley based on the ratio that I got by joining them. Right? So essentially, if I have 2 by 7 here, I will sample every New York value with 2 by 7. And if I have 2 by 5 here for Berkeley, I will sample every row or every uh, corresponding tuple with Berkeley with this corresponding probability of 2 by 5. So I get something exactly like what I had in my previous slide. But in this case, I have two tuples from NYC and two tuples from Berkeley with different weights. So every tuple for NYC had a weight of 2 by 7, and every tuple of Berkeley had a weight of 2 by 5. And similar to the previous uniform sampling, it basically does not change any spark or short RDD semantics. So this is exactly behaving like an RDD or I mean, new uh, API we call it data frames. This is exactly like a data frame in Spark. If you process or aggregate on any of these data frames, it will give you a correct aggregate answer, which is scaled to the right number with a corresponding error. So this is just a sample data frame or a sample RDD. Uh, so I have a question here. Yeah. So uh, that count, um, mm -hmm. getting that count, we have to scan the whole data set because we got that there are seven uh, data points for New York and uh, five for Berkeley. Yes, exactly. So, which is why like all of these things is an offline operation. Like you do it once, you create a sample, and then any query that you operate operates on a sample, which is extremely fast. So the scanning and kind of constructing samples is done offline, and then your query execution is only done on a sample of data, which is just these four rows. So at query runtime, you just operate on a small sample of data. Is it fair to say that you know, like uh, something like this is more useful for patched data rather than you know, like streaming data? 
Uh, so uh, it depends. So essentially, even if you have streaming data, you can use sampling algorithms like reservoir sampling, which actually are tuned to basically streaming algorithms. Uh, although the point that I think you're trying to make is well taken, in the sense that like, if you have a streaming data, and you're only doing some computation on it once, mm. it's not really useful. Mm. Uh, in streaming, there's a different use case that many people generally have, which is called load shedding. Like, the concept of load shedding is, let's say I have like a huge stream of data coming in. Uh, I can basically insert a sampling operator really early in my stream, mm. and just never allow like more data that I can process to actually pass that operator. Now, if I have that data, I can now do like many complex analysis. So streaming data has this problem that like essentially I, my compu computation complexity can be pretty low, right? Because if I have like a huge stream of data coming in, I cannot take a lot of time in actually processing a certain quanta of data. So if you load shed uh, early on in the graph, then you can actually process more amount of data later on. So uh, if, we, if we try to compare the uniform samples and stratified samples, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, it looks like uniform sampling, just that part, is more better, better, more efficient time, whereas stratified ones are less efficient for time. Sure. Uh, but stratified sampling is actually necessary for a large variety of queries uh, because of the statistical properties that it provides. And, and another kind of like thing that I should have actually pointed out is like we don't really uh, care too much about time for creating samples because it's an offline operation. Uh, but I mean, yes, it, it stratified samples take a long amount of time to create because it constitutes a join, whereas uniform samples is just like a scan. So it, it, it looks like that we are having some assumptions before, like on one, one theory that uh, to apply this theory, we are taking some things in different uh, options. Yes, yes, yes. I'm a visual thinker. Just throwing it out there again. So if we are doing a criminal investigation, time is critical. So if you're doing image analysis, that I feel that is also easy. I'm just trying. To yeah. So I mean, essentially, and this is this is actually one of uh, uh, I mean, uh, so I mean, like if you are doing so, a SQL equivalent of the problem that you basically mentioned is applying machine learning to figure out image similarity. Or something, right? So essentially, what you are trying to just do is that like you are scanning like a, a large amount of images, and then you are trying to figure out images that are with a certain distance, where distance is some metric uh, between two images, right? It could be k means, it could be something like that you want to just uh, figure out. So yes, that's this is a perfect example because I mean now when you first sample, you can basically remove all the corresponding images or all the things that are tagged with things that you are not interested about, like. In, in case of the exactly. So I mean, exactly. So you can just filter curated, curated domain and absolutely. 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 And kind of a related example is also kind of personalized medicine. Like if you want to figure out like which medicine basically works on a certain category of patients, you can filter everything that's basically not concerning those parameters, and then you can actually like quickly sample. Figure out like how many different attributes for a certain category of patient that you want to look at, and things like that. So yeah, there are basically a lot of related use cases. Yeah, the gross, you know, the gross ki baat ho rahi hai, humko ye sab jagah lagega, right? Abey accuracy ki baat ho rahi hai, lekin humko gross mein ye har jagah lagega. Gross mein, like I, I didn't get that. Well, you have to be in the ballpark of the answer, and it's very accurate. Uh, okay, so the second part is basically figuring out error bars or figuring out uh, uh, this concept of like, I mean, returning fast and approximate answers with error bars by operating on these samples of data. So, just a small kind of like, I mean, uh, intuition of how we calculate error. So, uh, uh, the basic aggregate functions that we have average, count, sum, variance, and standard deviation. We can actually estimate the error that we incur when we operate on these samples of data by just applying the central limit theorem. Now central limit theorem is basically like, uh, what it says is that any aggregate or any point estimate that I create by operating a query on a sample of data lies in this nice Gaussian or normal distribution. And I can just plug in some formulas to figure out the corresponding errors for those functions. 
right? So from a, from a system designer's perspective, if you don't want to care about statistics, all this means is that I can figure out the count error, or the error in count, by just putting in the sample size, the sample probability. I can figure out maybe the sum error by putting in sample size, probability, the mean, in some cases the variance. Uh, there are some things in variance, for example, which might require a fourth moment to be calculated. But all in all, I mean, from a systems perspective, it is just like a certain set of formulas that you can just code it up and figure out what the corresponding error is if your, if your query has any of these five things. This is, uh, like, so okay, just, just before I go into the next slide, uh, as far as implementation, implementing this is concerned, this is actually fairly easy, right? Because a simple query has this kind of an op like graph, which has a sample and then it might have a logical graph, corresponding <coughs> aggregate. If your aggregate is anywhere between average sum, count, standard deviation, and variance, all you can do is modify that aggregate function, modify that code in Spark, to basically return that corresponding approximate aggregate and the corresponding error, right? And that error can be just obtained by putting values in the five formulas that I showed. The problem with that is that it's actually not generic. It, it only was applicable to a certain set of aggregate functions, and it will not scale to anything that I showed you before, right? If you filter your query, if you join your query with other tables, if you basically have like ML primitives, user-defined functions, and so on and so forth. So in order to actually support a general set of queries, we have another method uh, that's pretty well known in statistics, and it's called bootstrap, statistical bootstrap. Uh, bootstrap, as a method, is actually applicable to complex and nested queries. It's also applicable to user-defined functions. It's applicable to joins, complex filters, and so on and so forth. Now, how does bootstrap work? It's actually pretty neat. Let's say I have a query that operates on a certain sample of data, and it gives me an approximate answer A. And I want to calculate the corresponding error that's associated with that answer. Now, what Bootstrap says is that take in a sample, right? And then insert this resampling operator in the query graph. Now, what this resampling operator does, it actually creates a sample with replacement from my original sample that's of exactly the same size as my original sample. So let's say I have four rows, right? And let's say it's like one, two, three, four in my sample. Now, if I have to calculate a sample with replacement that's of exactly size four, I will pick a row, let's say I pick two, okay? I'll put it in my sample, and then I'll put it back. Then I'll pick a row again, maybe this time I pick one, right? I put it in my sample, and I put it back. Pick a row again, maybe I'll pick two again, right? And maybe the next time I'll pick four. So now I have something like one, two, two, four, right? So I create one such resample from my original sample and from, from my corresponding query. And I do this 100 times, or many, many times, right? So if I basically create resamples that are exactly the same size as my original sample with replacement many, many, many times, and I execute my query on these 100 resamples, I get 100 different answers, right? So essentially, I am executing this query on like many, many hundred or many, many samples of data, many, many resamples of data, and I get these 100 resamples. And the corresponding variance of these 100 answers that I got actually gives me an estimate of the error that's incurred when I operate my query on this sample of data, right? So note that this method is actually fairly generalized. It does not assume anything about what this query looks like. And it could be anything. This could be a machine learning function, it could be a ML perimeter, it could be it could be a fancy query with joints, it could be a fancy query with filters. It does not care. All you have to do is to basically give these corresponding resamples to the query, execute the query on these resamples, and give uh, and basically compute the variance on these many, many answers that you get. This happens in real time. Yes. So, because you're operating on these small samples, okay? Uh, but the small sample could again be like yeah. one gigabyte per data. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, this error estimation is also taken into account when we are talking about that return to be Absolutely. 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 So, uh, actually, I might have some backup slides uh, to show how actually. Uh, I, I can I can I can uh, talk more about how we actually do this kind of like uh, estimation really fast. 
So you don't actually have to act, uh, create or execute these queries individually. You can actually do all of this in uh, like together. But I just kind of like skip those details as part of this talk. Yeah, but I'm trying to make something like this when I was talking about you know like that in the sample set that you had, I could pick up different right. values. So, yeah. Right, right. So I can I can right. use the whiteboard to explain that maybe uh, after the talk if you guys are interested. But there is this technique called personalized resampling uh -huh. uh, that we basically came up with last year to actually like execute all of these queries just once. So you don't actually execute 100 queries at runtime because that might be expensive. Uh, you just execute this entire query once uh, so that your answer is really good. Uh, last but not the least, like we just verify the correctness of the error bars that it returns at runtime. So nobody is actually going to trust an approximate query processing framework if it actually returns a wrong answer once in a while. So in order to basically figure out, or in order to actually like, uh, before returning the answer to the user, we actually verify the correctness of the error bars that we return at runtime. Now, just giving a brief intuition around that, like the entire problem here is to actually, for a certain sample, if we give back the corresponding error, we need some kind of like way of knowing whether this error is correct or not, right? So in order to actually estimate whether the error is correct or not, what we do is we actually create or we actually execute our queries on very, very small samples of data. So again, like this is the sample size on the x-axis. We execute a query on very, very small samples of data and kind of try to estimate the error that we incur by executing our queries on small samples of data. Now, based on this data points that we have, we actually bound like the, we actually create a lower bound and an upper bound by extrapolating these small errors and then trying to figure out if this error that we return back to the user is correct or not. I'm actually not going to go too much into the details of how this algorithm works, but one intuitive thing is like essentially if we have more and more data that we actually sample here, we get a very high accuracy of figuring out whether the corresponding error is correct or not. Uh, this actually was part of like a, a big part of what my kind of like grad school research was all about. So there are like two papers that we published on this particular method. Uh, but in general, I mean, we basically figured out that around 300 data points, if we actually get like around 300 data points here, we can with a very, very high accuracy predict whether the error that we returned back to the user is correct or not. So all in all, I mean, this was the three steps of actually figuring out First of all, creating and maintaining a variety of stratified and random samples from the data, uh, returning fast and approximate answers with error marks, and then finally verifying the correctness of the corresponding uh, answer before returning back. To the user. Why do we uh, why do we need this right case that verifies the correctness? Because if your product is uh, I think good, then it must give the right. correct answer. So so uh, 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 I actually like, uh, briefly talked about it at the beginning of the talk, but. Uh, one, one problem with like approximate query processing is that there are some operators which are not like which cannot be approximated, right? There are some queries or some aggregates which cannot be approximated. I'll give you a small example. Think about max. Like, uh, if you have to figure out the maximum from a huge data stream, there is no way you can approximate it. Why? Because let's say that I have a data set that has all ones and there is one value that's like one million, right? Unless my sample has that one million value, there is no way that I can figure out that the max of this corresponding data is one million, right? I will always think that it's one, irrespective of what my corresponding data is, right? So the, the problem with this is that like there are certain operators, certain uh, aggregates that cannot be approximated, which means that any method, bootstrap, or any of these kind of things would actually give me a wrong answer. So the third verification step is actually necessary to prune out all of those things. Does that make sense? And uh, when you say maintains, uh, when, uh, so maintaining is you know like uh, having that sample and keeping it in the base it until the next sample. Uh, maintaining is also referring here to the fact that let's say that I created my sample on uh, today's data. Right. Now tomorrow new data comes in, right. so I can still have that one gigabyte of sample that I created, right. but I just have to update it or refresh it. So, so that's with the, new with new the data, data that came in after or came in tomorrow. Because we end up, uh, okay, uh, you know, like, again just trying to draw a So uh, sometimes when we are you know, like, uh, doing these uh, 
humongous calculations, if you will. So we also end up, you know, like uh, maintaining that last calculated data, plus you know, like the date of any new thing, which yes. so just like the lambda architecture kind of thing. Exactly. So okay. So so this is where the maintain part comes in, where it puts in the data. Right. And also part of it is what you talked about, right? I mean, essentially, it's uh, you have to intelligently figure out like what to cache and what not to cache. Uh, that we don't actively, we have not actively integrated it that as part of BigDB itself because that's basically a general decision, right? If you if you have lots of queries that are operating on your sample of data, that should be there should be some LRU cache or there should be some like frequency based cache that should cache your data in memory. But if you have a lot of queries that are operating on your non-sample data, maybe that should be packaged over. So irrespective of where your data is on disk or memory, it would just basically dictate how much accuracy you can get in a certain thing. Uh, uh, because one example that uh, uh, all the data points would be one and one is the one million, uh, something like that. Uh -huh. In that case, uh, how uh, NIMDP would you maintain correctness or uh, you, how would your short part would be uh, taken this uh, particular instance? Uh, can, can you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, uh, you have given an example that uh, uh, there may be scenario that all the data points would be could carry a one mm -hmm. and uh, one specific ah, scenario they would be one million. Sure. And in that particular case, how will we be able to maintain the correctness? So in this particular case, it depends on what the query is, right? So for for so if you look at this graph, right? So if I have like in this particular case, like if I have uh, all ones and there is one value of one million, right? And I am calculating a max. So in that case, like I will see maybe like if I am actually having a lot of points or a lot of data points here, maybe one of these with some probability would actually pick one million, and all others would basically pick one, right? Which basically means that one of these data points would basically have a, a higher error, and all others would have a pretty low error because all are ones, right? So so if I actually extrapolate and figure out what the corresponding error is. Uh, for for basically those operators, I would totally see that this data point that I saw, which had a very low error, because maybe it only saw all ones, is wrong. Does that make sense? The second statement, like 300 data points means 90. Out of what data points? Oh, I'm talking about these data points. So 300 data points here actually can give me a 97 percent accuracy of predicting this. Uh, this is kind of like a hand wavy statement because I have not told you the algorithm that I am used uh, using. And that's, uh, your, and that's your PhD thing. Is it? Uh, it is one, it is okay. part of it. So I, I'll be very happy to talk about it. But I thought like it would be too much for this talk. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean the intuition is that if you do, if you calculate these data points like a lot of times, you can actually predict the accuracy of this guy like really well. Uh, so just this, I mean, almost done. Uh, but essentially, uh, the first step that we already talked about, creating and maintaining a variety of samples, is an offline process. Whereas the second thing that we have is an online process. Uh, so what basically this means is that like when a query comes in, uh, you actually create or you estimate the error, you execute the query, and then you verify its correctness in an online fashion. Uh, what this means in general is like, I mean, so let's say that you have this original data that you have in the system. First of all, a sampling module creates offline samples. So these are just uniform samples. This is some way of indicating a stratified or a, a more kind of like biased sample. And we have an optimization module that kind of like figures out what stratified samples or what kind of uniform samples that you create or you need in the system. Uh, these samples that based on whatever underlying properties of the system is, are either stored on disk or are partially cached in memory. Uh, now when a particular query comes in, so it could be a high query, it could be a sigma query, it's bounded by a particular time bound or an error bound, a query plan gets created, and the sample selection module essentially selects a particular type of sample and that particular size of the sample that you want to execute your query on. Right? So this is just basically saying that like, hey, I want something within two seconds, and I want to select this sample with this corresponding time bound. Uh, based on this, a new query plan is created, and then you basically execute your query on any framework that you have, or any query processing framework that you have, and augment that with the corresponding uh, error bound. So we ourselves support Spark, but BlinkDB in general has been implemented both on Hive 
uh, and Presto. Presto is a SQL engine that came out of Facebook uh, sometime for the future. So, uh, can, can you tell us about the first Because uh, while, uh, while uh, selecting a query plan, uh -huh. we're, we're talking about that uh, we, uh, the online sample selection to take best samples based on query you can see in Yes. So my samples are already in memory. Uh, so it depends. So part of your sample could be memory, part of your sample could be, so this is memory and this is disk. So part of your sample could be memory. It could entirely be in memory, it could entirely be on disk. Okay. This is just basically. Okay. So. So I think it, it works in that case where we, make, we cannot fit the whole data inside. Exactly, exactly. So samples could be huge, right? It could it could span like tens of terabytes or even larger. So it doesn't. It, so the samples are not on. The one, uh, they doesn't have a uh, requirement on them that they have to be in memory. There's no such requirement. Okay. Uh, so I'll just conclude with some numbers. Uh, what I have here is like, I mean, I just have like a few small set of queries just to convince you guys like of the kind of time scales that we're talking about. So I have like five queries here, two from this company called Omniga. Omniga actually is a company that actually uh, is the Eon's company, Eon's like I was my advisor at Berkeley. Uh, this company actually does a lot of video analytics. So the kind of query that I showed you in the beginning of buffering ratio and things like that, it does a lot of those things. Uh, so I took two queries from Omniga, two queries from Facebook. Uh, Facebook does a lot of queries around like uh, click tracking. So every time someone clicks on an ad, like it tries to basically suggest things that are basically, I mean, uh, based on the user and based on the user uh, browsing behavior. And a lot of Facebook queries are kind of like in that area. And then PPCH is a well-known database benchmark that has like a certain set of transaction or a certain set of like uh, business-related queries. Uh, so I picked like one of them uh, for this uh, analysis. Each of these queries operated on a 20 gigabyte sample of data, and depending on the original size of the data, remember that I told you that essentially the original data does not matter, only the sample size matter. So depending on the size of these companies or the size of the benchmark, this sample was anywhere between 0 0.001 to 1% of the original data that they had. And since the error only depends on the sample size, each of these queries, the way we pick these queries and the answers, they, we targeted something around 95 to 99% accuracy. Uh, so these were the two Conviva queries, these were the two Facebook queries, and one was the last PPCH query. Now, for these five machines, for these 20 gigabytes of data, uh, it took somewhere around like one second to actually process these queries and returning an answer. Uh, it took less than 0.5 seconds, so more like 100 or 200 milliseconds to actually estimate the error that we incur when we process these like five queries on uh, these five machines. And then finally, the diagnostic step or the verification step that basically told us whether the given error is correct or not. And again, like the verification step actually involves like these 300 data points and things like that. Took another one second to basically figure out. So all in all, what we see is that we have this entire query uh, that's operating on a fraction of data. This fraction depends on the obviously what the original data size is. But these 20 gigabyte sample of data gave us something around 95 to 99 percent accuracy for a wide variety of like different use cases that these a lot of these companies had. And all of these answers we could get to like somewhere between like two to 2.5 seconds. So. Uh, uh, is there a way to track all these response times in, in the smart itself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, when you know that uh, you know, like the error verification overhead, uh, can it be a, you know, like an input to a machine learning algorithm where we do not spend so much time on error verification, knowing that you know, like all our other error verification so far, they have been kind of okay. And we know that you know, like the data data set that for for Pandiva, mm -hmm. for example, uh, we know that you know, like whatever we are approximating, that is that is fine. You know, like we do not need an error verification. Is that, uh, that possibility or so error verification? I mean, also depends on the query, right? So yeah. essentially. Uh, not only really the data, but the query. So yeah. you could always have like this crazy yeah. query yeah. that we need a verification for. Uh, so can we omit that part? For example, if you, if you if you have some higher level layer that says that the user can only have these ten types of queries, then yes. Yeah. Uh, if if I can guarantee that the user will never ask me max or min 
or like some crazy query that does not uh, that cannot be approximated, then yes, you can omit the error. Okay. But if you want to support general queries, then then no. Uh, okay. So so as far as the engine or the Spark itself is concerned, like we are actively working towards integrating DimDB in the native Spark stack. Uh, so I mean, this is just like a brief overview of what Spark looks like. Uh, short, but uh, we like is I mean we, we have deprecated what we called short, and now we are calling it Spark SQL. Uh, and BingDB is something that's built on top of Spark SQL, which provides proximate queries. Uh, we have also streaming support. So in future, like we are actually thinking about integrating some of these operators in, in Spark streaming, so that we can even approximate like these streaming queries. Uh, we have MLlib. Uh, there is no current plan of actually supporting approximating like MLlib operators beyond what we currently support, like in terms of user-defined functions. But this is another area that we can actually look into and kind of like benefit from that. Uh, graph combinations and Spark R are other two kind of like any uh, frameworks that are being actively worked on. Uh, but we have not thought too much about like approximating graph combinations and R combinations. Uh, R might be actually really hard. Uh, graph combinations might be slightly more easier, but uh, no such plans. Uh, uh, okay, so just basically, um, like, uh, we, we actually have like a BinDB prototype that if you guys are interested, you can play around. It's available at bindb.org. Uh, uh, the prototype allows you to create samples on native tables and virtualized views. It basically adds any approximate aggregate functions with statistically close forms to like hype QL like queries. And then it's actually compatible with uh, Apache Hive. So if you're using Apache Hive, you can actually use when you it's uh, compatible with Spark. It's also compatible with Facebook Presto. Uh, and again, compatibility here means everything in terms of storage, series, UDFs, types, metadata, everything. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's about it. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, so it's, it's basically uh, uh, two or three people right now, but mostly like I mean we are actively actually focusing our efforts on Spark SQL right now, just so that like our foundations and our kind of implementation plans are solid, and then we will be moving towards a native Spark integration. Uh, the plan currently is around like 1.7 to 1.8. So uh, just for context, like I mean there are like three or four people working on Spark SQL at Databricks, but again from community there are a lot more. Yeah.